Thank you for attending the 2020 Sunstone Digital Symposium Session 235 titled, How Grief Permanently Changes You. The audio from this session will be available for purchase at sunstone.org after the symposium. The video recording of the session will be available in the Whova app for approximately three months beginning at the end of August 2020. If there's time left, then we might take questions. Otherwise, questions will be answered by Medi in the Whova app after the session sometime this weekend. At Sunstone, we are making it a goal to build a community that allows many ways for people to express their faith. Our tagline is, there's more than one way to Mormon. We invite you to help us build a community where all paths are given space to be better understood, 
please support us in our mission by making a donation and subscribing at sunstone.org. About this presentation. When you are grieving, people often want to help you get through it, as if there is some point at which you go, you'll go back to being who you once were. The reality is that grief never ends, that you will be forever changed, and that there are people who will not be able to go on this journey with you. This session presents real talk about what the grieving process does to you and how the people around you will perceive your grief. Hint, they kind of go crazy. I'll take a second to introduce you to our speaker before we begin. Mehdi Ivy Harrison is the author of the natural, or national, excuse me, best-selling Linda Walham series, beginning with The Bishop's Wife. She also authored multiple Book of Mormon fanics, such as The Book of Layman and Vampires in the Temple, published by BCC Press. She hosts the Mormon Sabbatical podcast. I will now give the floor over to Mehdi. All right, hello, this is very strange not being able to see any faces, but at least this is a presentation with few jokes. Um, all right, so to orient you, I am reading portions of my memoir, which is titled simply Mercy, which my agent will be sending out shortly to publishers in New York. Publishing has been sort of shut down over the, shut down for the rest of us. Um, so I'm gonna read you parts of it. I also have, some photos from the actual events, which I will be sharing. Um, I have a giant snot rag because I couldn't think of enough tissue paper that would work for me. Uh, hopefully you also brought tissue. The thing you need to know about my memoir is that it has three parts. The first part is from my journal that I wrote uh, for the year after Mercy died. So the day after she died, I started writing in this journal and I wrote every day for the next year with the idea that I would, of course, then be done with grief after that year. Um, and I'd stopped writing in it then. I only have that journal from, from that first year. Uh, so that's the first part. The second part of the memoir are poems that I wrote mostly in 2018 as I was coming back and reworking the memoir after a long passage of time. And the, the third part of the memoir is the person I call New Medi, which is this person in front of you, who is trying to figure out sort of how I became New Medi after I feel like there was this very, very different person that I used to be. Sometimes I feel like she's so completely different that I don't know how to explain the change from her to me. So I don't know that I'm actually reading from parts of the journal, but when I refer to old Medi, that's the, the Medi in the journal, the Medi I was 15 years ago, and new Medi is me as I stand before you now. All right, um, I, as I said, I have the presentation. I'll be sort of moving back and forth between it. Let me share my screen. All right, that's the beginning slide. Okay, here we go. This is the story of two deaths and of the one life that grew out of them. The first death was my daughter, Mercy. August 29th, 2005, Mercy was stillborn after a difficult 42 week pregnancy. I never had the chance to see her alive, to welcome her into our family or to do any of the things that mothers are supposed to do when their children are born. The second death was my own. It did not happen immediately, but the person I was when Mercy died does not exist anymore. That person is so radically different from who I am now. She had never been broken by anything she'd ever faced. She was so utterly confident, full of chutzpah, as one of my professors said of me in graduate school. She had no idea how extraordinary that was. She was just herself and also utterly blind to so much of what made her tick. She saw none of the anxiety that propelled her forward. She only saw purpose and drive to perfection. She was very good at what she did, and there are many times when I still wish I was her. This is the first poem I wrote as part of this book back in 2015. I'm buried. I'm buried under my daughter's stone, her name and the single date of her birth death. No need to wait for my body to join us there though the space is reserved 
for me and my husband when the time comes. It was August when her tiny, beautiful, never breathing body was covered in dirt and grass and stone. She wore a yellow dress I had hand knit for her sister and makeup the mortician thought would make her look alive, though it didn't. There was a photo of her there, touched up and perfect, so that she looked like any other baby with her eyes closed, pink and rosy cheeked. I wish that I could change my memories of that day that, so that she looked like that instead of black and gray and dead. Her sister sang, Heavenly Father, are you really there? And I thought that he was. We sent balloons with messages of love into the sky as though she could somehow read them in heaven. Once we went back and had a picnic at the cemetery. French bread and brie, camembert the other kids had never had before. I wanted the memories of her to be not all bad. I wanted the kids to remember her as part of the family, as their sister, not just a tiny body in a casket. We went back to the grave in November and it was covered in snow. I was so angry that she was alone in the frozen cold, her little body wrapped in a simple Afghan from a friend. What kind of a mother leaves her infant like that and drives away home? But we all pretended that it was normal. We brushed off the stone to read the scripture. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And she does follow me. She is never absent. Sorry, I'm, I'm transitioning back to She is never absent, though I didn't realize it was a curse, not a blessing. I think I died in May of the following year, but it might have been later. I might have hung on longer than it seems when I look back. It took no knife, no bleeding, just a giving up and a hiding away. I buried myself inside the body that still breathed. No one knew I was dead. There was no funeral for me. I died invisibly, and so there is no stone for me but the one I carry in my heart. It has my name on it and no date, but her date. It doesn't matter when I died. As soon as she died, I was already on my way. Mercy's death broke the person I was in ways that can never be healed. First and foremost, Mercy's death stole that confidence and shook my faith in everything to the very foundations. I doubted Mormonism, but also God and the very laws of the universe. I hated myself, then tried to change myself, then finally allowed myself to give up. I damaged nearly every relationship I had in my anger and despair. I felt like I was falling into an endless pit without any bottom because I'd spent my life convinced that my worth depended on accomplishments and checklists and believed that I had controlled everything because of my devotion to rules and righteousness. I've spent a lot of time in therapy trying to reconcile these two parts of myself, trying to figure out why I feel that old Medi is dead and that nothing of her now remains. I'm pretty sure that she died by suicide because she couldn't live with the new terms of the contract for living that were required after Mercy was gone. She could not survive in the world where she was no longer in control and where she had to face the reality that any of her other kid children could die at any time and she could not save them. New Medi is often angry at old Medi for giving up and just disappearing wherever she went. Wasn't she supposed to be stronger than that? She was the grown up, the adult, and she left behind this tiny new creature, so like the baby Mercy, that should have been born alive, needing support and love and protection that New Medi never got. But old Medi's death is also the only thing that allowed New Medi to survive because it cleared out space and it let her grow up without a lot of the baggage and demands that old Medi had lived under. Every once in a while, I feel like old Medi is still here, a tiny part of her inside of me, resurrected and maybe allowing me to be kind to people I see who are also so much like the person I was then. So right and anxious and sure of the future and so unforgiving, mostly of herself and the mistakes she wouldn't let herself see because if she did, it would destroy her, as it did when the truth finally hit me. Old Medi would be horrified, I think, to see what has become of her body. I sometimes have these existential moments of dissociation where I'm walking down the road and think, wait, how did I get here? Who am I? This isn't the person I was supposed to grow up to be. 
Old Medi would vociferously point to a completely different future self as definitive. She would never have become new Medi. She would be distressed to be me far more than I am distressed to have been her. Though I am finding out, I apologize a lot to people who knew me back then. This is a poem I write, wrote in 2018 about the two me's meeting in the past. Two selves. Old me and new me stare at each other across the table. She is so young with her big bangs and her big eyebrows. She is so confident, so sure of herself and her world. She beams with happiness and she doesn't know that new me is herself in 30 years. She thinks that the other woman is just an older friend who has gone astray. She wants to bring her back to the fold. She reminds her that she was happier before and that she doesn't want to give up everything just for the dubious reward of telling her truth. I look at her and think how strange it is to see her here. I don't know what to say to her. She is trying to be kind, but I can feel the condescension, the superiority. I wish we could be friends, but I don't know how to tell her that I am her. I am her future. I am who she will become. She doesn't want to become me. She doesn't believe she will become me. She loves herself and I love her, old me. But even I have a hard time loving new me. I wonder if she sees the age lines around my eyes, the drooping breasts, the dark sunspots on my face and hands, the graying hairs around my temple, the sagging butt, the fading lines of pregnancy weight, the bike accident scars on legs and elbows, the loose skin around my jaw, the ruined toenails from running, the eyes and ears needing aids to function. Why would she want to become me? I try to think of the good things, the things she wanted that I have. The career, the fame, the reputation, the books published, the races won, the Boston Marathon, the medals and t-shirts, the children born and raised and sent off to college with scholarships and honors. The growth and development past anything she imagined I, we, might do. But we sit there across the table and I don't tell her who I am. I don't tell her that time travel is real and that this is the only chance we will ever have to talk to each other. I hold her hand and give her my best advice. I tell her I love you and that someday you will be a wonderful mother and you will write books you will be proud of. But she shrugs and can't look me in the eyes anymore. I've embarrassed her by revealing how much she wants what I have and how much she doesn't want what I have lived. I suppose this last line is one of the saddest. I didn't want this life. I didn't want to become new Medi. I fought the change as hard as I could, but I also reached a point where I realized that if I didn't give up old Medi, I would kill myself. Her rules dictated that I was not a worthy person to live. So here I am, an unworthy person to live. And sometimes life is very, very hard. But this me tries to remember, even in those moments, that it is also still sweet. It is the only life we have and death will come soon enough. One thing that I admire about Old Medi was her ability to write well. Though she didn't use it often to talk about her own life, those skills were at hand to document what happened when her world came crashing down on the day her youngest child was stillborn. She had all the words to describe the excruciating agony of realizing her lack of control over the universe that she had tried so desperately to ignore for so long. On the day that changed everything, Old Medi relied on her habit of daily writing and on the idea that somehow, if she found words for it, they would help her through. What she didn't realize was that this was the beginning of the end of her. She didn't know that she had already begun to change because she was so busy trying not to let go of all the things she'd clung to for so long. When I talk to people about a faith crisis, I hear them say all the time, I'm the same person as I was before, and I am so confused by this. I do not feel that I am the same person at all. It has taken a great deal of therapy to convince me that there are any similarities between the person I am now and the person I was then. It's also been difficult for me to accept that there are good things about the person I am now and not just a series of losses and mistakes and failures. The same person. I'm not the same person I was. I look in the mirror and see the marks of pain and age in the lines on my face, in the sagging jowls, the frown lines and crow's feet, the red nose and trails of tear from eyes to chin. I'm not the same person I was. I can't watch that show no matter how well written if a child dies in the end. I can't hold my bladder like I used to or run without a limp. 
I will always look back, always second guess every choice. I will always say I love you to my kids as if it is the last time because it may be. And even if they survive, they will come back changed and I will be new again too. I said before, I am broken. This broke me. No, I don't need you to tell me that I am not broken. I need very much for you to accept that I am broken. And no, I don't need you to help me heal either. I'm healing, whatever that means, in my own way. I've come to the conclusion that while people can offer suggestions or even suggest patterns, ultimately this is a journey you take alone. You find out a lot about yourself along the way and it is not always pretty. I've seen the ugly in myself, the mean, the whiny, the angry, the vengeful, petty person that comes out of this. I became both better and worse, both more compassionate and more selfish. I survived. I lived through this. This is my story about how I did that, even when I sometimes didn't want to. If I could have, I would never have left the hospital. I would have held on to Mercy's body forever. I would never have gone back to the needs of my other children. I would never have written the parts of this book. I wanted to do nothing. I wanted to be nothing, but I didn't get my first choice or maybe my second. This is what I made of my third choice. All right, I'm going to stop and go back to my um, slideshow here and show a few more of the images that I have. Um, most of the photographs of the family uh, of Mercy and the family are in black and white because a, a volunteer from an organization called SHARE came and took a lot of the photos. So I have these all in black and white. And then I have some color ones that were taken by Matt's, my husband's dad when he came um, a little bit later. So these are pictures of the funeral, very Mormon funeral, um, family members all around. Uh, here's the tiny little casket and um, Matt's brothers, my husband's brothers are carrying the casket. This is the back of our bishop who came down for the funeral. He really did his best to try to help us. I think ultimately I am <laughs> was unhelpable, at least in the way he wanted me to be helped. Um, I, here's, this is, was me, um, and I, I remember I didn't have anything in my wardrobe I could really wear because I was two days after my pregnancy was over. So I ended up going to the store and buying this black dress. It was the best I could find for this kind of a funeral. And one hey, of the Maddie, things I, yeah? You're not, you're not sharing your screen, so we aren't seeing the pictures. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, what it's am okay. I doing? Let's go to the bottom. There should be a share screen. There uh, you go. Can you see it's it coming now? On. Yes, ma'am. Thank All you. All right, I'm sorry. Okay, here's, here's the black and white photo of Mercy um, when she was born. Here's the funeral um, and the casket. That's the bishop from the back. Here I am in this black dress. And one of the things I quoted was my youngest son, Zach, he was two at the time. When he came to the hospital, um, all the other kids were interested in looking at the baby's body, but he was not. He looked at her very briefly and said, when she's alive again, then we will play with her. And it was a very child's view of death, um, but I quoted it in the funeral, still hanging on very much to this Mormon idea that you know, all the pain of death would be taken away in the resurrection, something I don't really trust in anymore. Um, this is my oldest daughter, Hope. She, she played the violin, um, Ring Out Wild Bells, which I think I talked about in the poem. And this is Sage, my second daughter. She sang, Heavenly Father, are you really there? So Sage is an incredible musician and ended up getting a scholarship to Berkeley School of Music for her vocal talent um, 10 years after this. And this is my husband speaking. And here are the balloons that I reference. Um, everybody had a balloon and they wrote little messages. You can see the little pieces of paper at the bottom of the balloons. And um, okay, I'm gonna stop screen share and go back to my um, talk. Mm -hmm. I wasn't a nice person during this period. I was alternately distant, cruel, selfish, demanding, and just plain bitchy. It was like I had been wounded and there was a scar forming, but it itched all the time. And when I scratched, I made the wound open again and bleed. And then I was angry at myself and at everyone else who wasn't wounded and at the world that had wounded me. I was trying so hard, but I wasn't the person I had been. 
I wasn't the person I would become. I was nowhere real yet, desperate for some purchase, hoping that this wouldn't be as hard as I was starting to sense it would be, wanting to go backward and not forward into the unknown. I became this person because the new person could live through a child's death and not still hate herself and not wish every moment of her waking life and some of her sleeping life that she was dead and did not have to carry the pain of not being a good enough mother or not being a good enough Mormon to pass the test. I survived, but for people who think that you have to confess you've healed and you aren't broken anymore and that you've moved on, I say, no, no, it's not true. Angry, bitter people get things done. Sometimes people who are most broken are most powerful because they admit they are not healed. So yes, I did more than survive, though I have not moved on. I wrote, I created art. I used my pain to make sense of life. I don't lash out at other people as much now because I understand my emotions better. I have chosen to take a look at the dark portion of the iceberg beneath the smaller, more visible top. I have chosen to share my pain with other people, a kind of vulnerability I know old Betty would not only have shied away from, but have been frightened of, for good reason. Normal people do not share like I'm sharing. They don't need to. But they don't write books like this one, books that I hope make some hearts break open and other hearts feel seen in their brokenness. I'm also trying to reclaim some of my choices after what I call grief paralysis, which lasted for a long time after Mercy's death. For many years, it felt like life was happening to me and not me to it. It felt like I had no energy to make choices, and so I was just a victim of everything other people chose around me. That's not a healthy way to see the world or yourself. I need to do things now that are sometimes strange just because it helps me believe that I have power in the world again, that I can make choices that other people wouldn't make. I'm reclaiming myself most of all. There are three girls in my extended in-law family who were born in the year of Mercy's death. They are beautiful teens now and such close friends at family events, which makes every family event painful in ways that I don't know how to talk about. After all, it's not their fault that seeing them makes me go still and weep or have to leave the room for a while. It's not their parents' fault that their daughters lived and mine did not. I'm sure everyone would say that I'm allowed to cry and that there's understanding. But you don't understand this if you haven't been through it. You don't know how it poisons all the good things that you used to look forward to and makes all the easy things hard. Those three girls stand together holding hands, doing each other's hair, holding sparklers, dancing a routine they plan together, doing karaoke or helping pass around dessert. And I am gutted, not just a little bit, completely gutted in a way that I had never known was possible. It feels like an awful thing to admit that I am sad precisely because they are so happy together. I am a monster to feel these things and I know it. But Mercy should be with them. She should be holding a microphone and singing with them. She should be dressing up in silly costumes for the funny dance number they're doing. She should be a part of the month of the photographs devoted to those three girls on the family calendar. She should have been at all the 4th of July parties with all the treats and barbecue and fireworks dressed in red, white, and blue like the rest, but she isn't. She never will be. All right, I'm gonna go back to, hopefully I'll get the share screen right this time. All right, this is one of the photographs that Matt's dad came that's in um, color. I'm sorry if these photographs are upsetting to you. Um, I put them away for a long time, for almost 10 years, and only took them out again a couple years ago to look at them. Um, they're all we have, so I have to accept them as they are. Um, this is the touched up photo of Mercy that I talked about in the poem. Uh, one of Matt's friends was really good with Photoshop, and so he, blew up the photo of Mercy and tried to make her look more alive. This is a sketch of Mercy that my sister, Emily, who had been estranged from her family for a long time, but when she found out about my daughter's death, she came. She spent many, many months doing a different image and then um, a more complicated image, but the simple one was the one that I liked. 
Um, oh, so I was, <sighs> all right, I will go back to my story here. The family calendar has a tiny image of my sister Emily's pencil drawing of Mercy to mark her birth death date. But those girls won't think of Mercy when they laugh together. Why should they? She is nothing to them. She has never existed in their minds. She isn't missing in their hearts. Their parents never think of her when they clap at graduations or concerts or when they tell them to do the dishes and they argue. They don't even think of Mercy when they turn to the side and I see a silhouette that might have belonged to my daughter who shares so much genetic material with theirs. But I will always be thinking of Mercy. I am the cautionary tale of the woman who won't let go of her grief, who won't move on and heal and talk about all the lessons she's learned and how much she's grown and become better. I'm the one who looks bitter, I suppose, because she isn't happy with what life has brought her. I'm not humble enough to say that God knows more than I do. I'm not grateful for what was left me. Okay, um, go back to my talk. Apologies. Okay, I learned very quickly after Mercy's loss that one of the most difficult things about grieving was other people sh throwing their shit onto you. I suppose I have to admit that I probably did this myself to others plenty, utterly unknowing before. Before I'd been through this journey myself, I had no idea how to act when someone had faced a loss and I panicked. I did stupid things like hiding away from another person because I didn't know what to do or say and probably making them feel like they were somehow contaminated or unworthy of me continuing to have a relationship with them for no other reason than that their grief made me uncomfortable and aware of my own limitations. I also said stupid stuff, thinking that somehow my job was to tell them some story that would help them get over their pain and move on with the rest of their lives. I thought that offering them a, a gift of a story of why it's not so bad was what you were supposed to do. Here's the problem. People grieve in different ways, and what might help one person is going to be exactly the wrong thing to say to another person. The best strategy is simply to say, I'm so sorry, and to keep saying it over and over again. I can't tell you how surprised I was to discover on the other end that the simple I'm sorry was the most beautiful thing that people gave me. They could say it in person or in a card, but that was far better for me than anything else they tried to do for me. I admit I am not every person on the planet and that I have some friends, although not many, who have said that they think I'm sorry is trite and who really appreciated stories about heaven. But mostly I think people want you to listen to them, tell their story. They want someone to help hold their pain. They want someone to acknowledge their world has been changed forever and will never go back. They want to be seen and heard, that's all. It's not that hard really, just go over, sit down and say you're there to listen. Things that were frustrating for me, constant deliveries of food. This is because I was busy dealing with nausea and we got so much food, which I know I should see as an outpouring of love for our family from so many people who were touched by our loss but I didn't know what to do with it. I felt like I couldn't just throw it out, so I had to figure out ways to store the many casseroles we got, which meant cleaning out the freezer and the fridge multiple times over those first few weeks, which is not exactly a great thing for someone who is recovering from a traumatic birth to do. I had other things to get done. Laundry still had to be done, shopping, cleaning, dealing with the realities of loss, like deciding what to do with all the baby's stuff. My kids, I will admit, tell me that they very much appreciated all the food that people brought over, especially the unhealthy stuff that I didn't usually let them eat. So there's that. People around us did many wonderful things that I will be forever grateful for. That said, there were also some terrible things that happened, things that I remember clearly, though I did not write them down in my journal at the time because I didn't know how to process them without being angry, and I didn't want to be angry. Nonetheless, what happened was that I felt profoundly dislocated from my community. I felt like I had to hide my real self away and could only show up with a fake happy right self at church events afterwards. For a time, I thought this cardboard version of myself after Mercy's death, and I called her Robot Medi. Robot Medi could answer the phone. She could make her body show up and do what other people expected her to do. She did it for a long time, but there was a cost to it, and it was the destruction of the sense of authenticity in most of my relationships. I hated the people that believed that Robot Medi was the real me. The only way to let go of that hate was to stop pretending all the time, but that had different costs associated with it too. 
people started staying away from me because they didn't like my anger, I think, because I made them depressed or sad or because they thought that I'd turned away from God. And I guess I had, the God I used to believe in anyway. I was trying to figure out if there was a different God to believe in though, and maybe a different me too. It felt wrong to me that in addition to dealing with my own grief, I also had this added burden of dealing with other people's fear of having to face their own vulnerability. It felt like what I needed was people to help me, and what I got was people who threw off their own problems onto me, often unconsciously, and left me with the burden of having to forgive them in order to try to move on with my life. If you see people around you who are struggling to move on, can I ask that you try to stop making their lives more difficult and perhaps even act as a protective barrier between them and the people who are giving them more, more, more emotional work to do? Work to do, undo the sting of other people's stupid words. Just ask anyone who is grieving what stupid things people said to them and they will have a long list, I guarantee you. Just affirm that those are stupid things. It will really help more than you can know. The closer you are to the person affected by tragedy, the more you will become aware of this reality and the more you can take up the responsibility to help avert the collision of well-meaning people and the hurt they can cause. You can check cards to see what they say and make sure they're safe. You can screen visitors for the first week or two. You can stand with the grieving family at the funeral and help divert people who are talking for too long about their own hobby horses and not being respectful of the moment. You can also do some of the work of arranging those things, taking the decisions back to those in charge. Though I did not do this, I also recommend that people not attend church or other events outside the home for a little while. The things you hear the first few weeks after a loss like this will stay with you forever and you often wish that they wouldn't. It's the worst things, honestly. I wish it weren't, but it's true. I can remember whole long passages of things people told me back then, even if I can't remember who brought me gifts or said kind things to me. You can't fix a loss like this, I would say to people. All the attempts to make it better, are just you trying to deflect the pain from the person suffering so it doesn't land on you. Instead of doing that, try sitting in silence more. Ask more questions. Be willing to mourn with those that mourn and comfort those that stand in need of comfort. I'm not someone who would say that you should just do whatever would help you either, because I think that's what people did, and it was sometimes a good, not a good plan. People may want very different things than you imagine. So ask. Don't be afraid of tiptoeing around the subject that you can't be blunt about questions. The death isn't going to get on you. <laughs> Although if you're a deeply compassionate person, maybe you can manage to hold the pain for a little while. One person might really appreciate you doing laundry or bringing food. That wasn't me because the boring old Troy's I once hated brought me comfort and helped me feel grounded in the new world I was struggling to make sense of. But I really appreciated the cards that were sent and the people who came and sat with me. It may have felt like they were doing nothing, but they helped me feel seen and heard. They helped me feel that I wasn't alone and that was a good thing, at least for a little while. Some people grieving may need babysitters on call. For me, again, that was a terrifying thought. I needed to stay with my children, see them at every moment and make sure they were still alive and that I was capable of being their mother. Another parent might need help with homework or driving kids to lessons or picking up grocery items or taking over a church calling. There are a thousand things that might help, ask. And if you don't get an answer, I don't think you should jump in and do what you think is best anyway. It can be very important to people who have been touched by loss to feel like they still have control over their lives. So their choices need to be honored. You can always send a card though. And if you show up in person to deliver it, but they don't want you to come in, accept that in good grace and wait for another time. There's a lot of time coming for grief. Most of all, I'd ask that you not be impatient with people grieving. Don't have a timetable that you think they should follow. Whatever the model of grief you think is supposed to be healthy, throw it out. People do grief on their own terms. They may cycle back through various stages again and again. They may have a day years after the loss that's worse than anything they faced in the beginning. They may not seem to be moving on at all. It's not your right to call them out on this. All you get to do is offer to sit with them, offer to help. Your judgment? Nope, none of that. Even if you've been through something very similar, you don't have a right to tell them they're doing it wrong. I think if I've learned one thing about grieving, it's that you never get over it. You never move on. You just learn which people are safe to share it with and which people aren't. Be one of the safe people, that's what I'm saying. Another thing I have to say is that after you have suffered a loss like this, other people will forget in what seems like 10 seconds flat. They will not realize that something they think is completely ordinary will hurt you deeply. 
I'm sure that no one can prevent every opportunity for pain, but there are some that should be obvious. If you've lost a baby, it will be difficult for you to hear about other people's babies. If you've lost a husband, you're probably going to struggle at someone else's wedding. Be aware of these situations and try to be kind to yourself or if you know of them to others. Sometimes the strangest thing will set me off and I can't predict them at all. Other times I think that people should just know better. It's so hard to be the person who sees pain everywhere, who is triggered by everything, but I became that person despite all my attempts not to be. I suppose that the other side of this coin is being the person everyone treats as fragile that they can't say anything to for fear of saying the wrong thing. I'm not really sure I want to be that person either, but maybe there's a third option. Also, and I cannot stress this enough, grieving people are crazy. When I say that, I'm, I mean that there are times when nothing you say is going to be the right thing to help them because nothing stops their pain. And if you can accept that, you're gonna be a lot better off. If you can see that it's not you, it's the grief, you can maybe be a little more resilient in these situations, except that it's not personal at all. There's one particular person in my husband's family who sat with me on several occasions months after Mercy's death and just let me rant about how sad I was and how awful my life was. We may have many other disagreements. We may never be able to talk politics or religion, but I will never forget that this person did this for me. Just let me be in pain. Just let me talk and listen. Didn't make suggestions, didn't judge, just listened for a little while. If you end up being the one who gets yelled at, just let the words slide off your back. If you're attacked for doing the wrong thing, apologize and try to do better. But also don't react like that person can never be trusted again. This is an anomaly. Yes, they will grieve forever, but the craziness does only last for a brief season. Anger takes up a lot of energy. <laughs> You burn out of it pretty quickly when you're grieving. So try not to let it destroy everything that went before. Try to wait it out. Am I really giving advice about this sort of thing? I guess I am now, that's what I've come to. Maybe it's unfair to blame a lot of these problems on grief, but they have persisted since Murphy's death. The inability to remember my schedule, forgetting things on the grocery list, losing names and faces of people I once would have recalled instantly, the easy ability to memorize quotes, even the ability to remember my own children's most hated foods, all of these things are gone now. So when I say I'm a broken person, that's why. Losing an arm seems like it would have been easier than all of that. All the things I'd relied on all my life to make me superwoman left with Mercy's death. And what did I get in the place of that? Compassion to the point of being paralyzed with shared pain. Deep insecurities about God, my own mothering, and the afterlife uncertainty about any truths I've ever known or thought I knew, patience to sit in silence, the ability to not do anything for long stretches of time. In some ways I value these things, but old Mettie didn't value them. She was resentful of them being thrust upon her. She wanted herself back. Of course she did. She had done so many great things, but old Mettie was snowed in by grief and it was just so hard to explain it to anyone. She, who had always had the words for things, was often unable to explain any of this except in ways that were offensive to her own tribe. Curse words, mostly. Once upon a time, I'd been one of those people who subscribed to the idea that if you cursed a lot, it was because you didn't have a big enough vocabulary to express yourself in other ways. And also that you were inappropriately angry about a whole series of things you should have better control over. What new Medi says to that now? Fuck it. With my Ironman competitions and my USAT rankings and my Boston qualifying marathon, See, I'm still a good person, a completely different person, but still. My national best-selling book, The Bishop's Wife, and my awards and podcast interviews, and my children getting into big name schools and paying off our house early. See, we're fine. We, we got through it. We didn't give up, even if I did give up a lot. The point here isn't to take out our wounds and measure them to see whose is worse. The point is that every loss is unique. Every person will deal it with it in their own way. And the idea that we point to certain people and say, oh, look how well they're doing with their loss. That tells us less about the person dealing with the loss and more about the person pointing. And those are just people who deal well with loss according to their own measures of what is useful to them and what makes them less comfortable. Well, there's a lot of selfishness in that. I hope no one ever uses this book to give to someone they think is taking too long to grieve. If that is what has happened to you, then you have the last laugh. This isn't that kind of book. This isn't a book to help you through your grief. This is a book to give yourself permission to sink into it more deeply, to be sadder and angrier and a little crazy sometimes. 
this is a book that tells you, yes, you learn some things through grief, but I'd prefer not to learn them that way. Thank you very much. And I believe that I would have gotten there anyway. The softer, easier way to compassion and enlightenment, please. So yes, if you're grieving, you get to be hurt by stuff that no one intended to hurt you. You get to be angry that no one thinks of you when they're planning the family Christmas party. And that stupid billboard with a baby on it is a knife to your heart. You get to complain about stupid things. You get to slow down and be stupid for a while. You get to not make sense of the world anymore. And you also get to tell people to mind their own business and they don't understand shit about what you're going through. Swear, be angry, shut the door or slam down the phone, start books and don't finish them, shout at the television, get too much sleep, drink and cry too much to make other people comfortable, live and hate that you are still living. This is another poem, uh, saying no to God. They say that God says no sometimes when you pray and ask for what you want, or he says, wait a while and be patient and it will come. I say no to God a lot. God asks me to be forgiving and I say, no, I can't, I don't know how. I say no to when God gives me a vision of what I need to do, a hard thing, no. I say no when God calls me to preach to the wicked in Nineveh. I say to God, let me be eaten by a whale. God asks me to be more patient. I say, wait a while, I can learn that in heaven after I'm dead. The God I used to believe in was angry when I said no. He waited to punish me. He set up tests to fail me. But my new God is kind. She laughs when I say no and tells me that God does nothing save it is by free will. I give myself permission not to be who I used to be. I do not worry about other people's feelings before my own. I give myself permission to be real about how bad I feel and how messed up my life is. I get to be hurt because people didn't think about my pain. I get to be mad at people who go on with their own lives and celebrate things I will never get to celebrate. I get to be bitter and angry at God. If you already sent a card and a casserole, maybe the last gift you can give to someone grieving is the gift of grace. It's a fucking wonderful gift to give to and you have to keep giving it again and again and again. They will never be the same. I will never be the same. At the time, I had no idea if my attempt at describing Mercy's death was a worthy effort, but by God, I was going to get it right. I was going to make sure that my feelings were so exquisitely written that other people would weep for mercy, people who had never seen her and had no connection to her other than my words. In some sense, my grief journal was an offering to her, the only thing I had left to give to the little girl I'd lost before I ever got to see her take a breath. Penance, yes, that. Redemption, yes, that too. But mostly it is what all of my writing is now, art from the rawest truth possible. I used to tell stories that were fun, stories I would have wanted to read at a younger age. They had depth, I think, but they weren't what they are now. They weren't offerings of my heart and soul. They weren't naked and bleeding. As a writer, I don't feel like I'm the one choosing the stories I write anymore. I believe that someone or something, the universe maybe, calls me to write stories. Some mornings I wake up and feel called to write something that had never occurred to me before, and so I write it. I try to leave myself open to this call, even if I'm working around deadlines for contracted books. I want to make sure that the deep need of the universe can be attended to. If I don't listen, then maybe the calls won't come anymore. Is this the lesson I was supposed to learn? To write the stories that God, if that's who is calling me to write, inspires or pesters me to tell? I no longer think that God works that way. I think that whatever form or personality God takes, God has less interest in us learning particular lessons and more interest in having a relationship with our true selves. So our job is always to go deeper and find the truer self that is still hiding. That is a lesson I learned from Mercy's death. There are so many good lessons, and somehow not one of them is good enough to justify her dying. Not one of them makes me say it was worth it. I remember reading that Emma Thompson said once, that I really like human beings who have suffered because they're kinder. And I was angry about that. If you read the whole quote, you'll see that she didn't really like admitting it either. I'm not sure what I think about it now. There's truth in it. People who have suffered tend to see pain more easily in others and to know how to help. They tend to not make assumptions and they know which are the terribly wrong things to say. But is that the same as saying that God wants us to have painful experiences though, so that we learn lessons? I don't think so. I suppose what I believe is that life gives us plenty of painful experiences just fine without God's intervention. I like to believe that I would have learned compassion. 
without having my innocent daughter taken away from this life. But is it true? I don't know. I really don't. All right, I'm going to share the last few images that I have on my screen here. Um, this is a little photograph the SHARE volunteers took of just of Mercy's hand, and I put it up in our front room, hoping, thinking that it would be okay to have, but a little girl came over to my house from our church and said she was scared of it because it was a dead baby's hand, so I ended up taking it down. In the year after Mercy's death, I took down everything that had anything to do with her, and I put it in this chest. You can see the lid of the chest. Um, my brother-in-law made the chest. He was the one who um, had a daughter born within a couple of days of when Mercy was due, and he did this wonderful work for us so that we have a chest to store all of her things in. You can see the, the wreath from her funeral and just all of the things that belong to her are in this chest. And I put it away and haven't looked at it for years until a couple of years ago. You can see a little dome. They did um, plaster hand molds and foot molds um, when we were in the hospital, the share people did. And this is a little collage of her. You can see the little handprints and footprints and some of the photos of the family members um, with her. Okay, I'm gonna finish my last two paragraphs here. Still, if I had to choose between a living daughter and my own compassion, I'd choose her. If I had to choose between her life and all the best-selling, award-winning, great Mormon novels that I've written since her death, and add to those all the books I might yet write, I would still burn them all down and take her hand in my own and bring her home with me. But that isn't one of my choices. And so my books are, in some weird way, a monument to her not to the child she would have been, because I have no idea about that. My writing is a monument to the hole that should have been filled with her. My writing is a howl into the void, a demand that she not be forgotten, even if I don't know who she might have been. This is what I do as a mother and a writer and as a new person born of grief. Okay, that's the end of my presentation. Is there time left for a few questions? It looks like there is. Yes, there is. Let me read okay. some to you, okay? Yeah. All right. The grief that comes with leaving the church and realizing that the church didn't really care, and nor did my member friends, human, excuse me, haunt me. How do I end the constant pain? I, I don't know. I, I feel like my talk has been all about um, how you don't end constant pain. Like, I, I feel really strongly that you lean into the pain and that you, like, the more we try to run away from our pain, the, um, the more uncontrollable it becomes. I'm not, I'm not going to say that somehow if you sink into the pain, that's, it will pass faster because that's not the goal. The goal is to be more authentic to who you are and, and um, to, like, be yourself. And so I guess I would say, like, stop trying to run from that. Um, yeah it will make you, you will say angry things to people. That is what happens, that's what's real. But I don't have a desire to not be me anymore. I feel like that was one of the things I learned from stepping away from the church and from all of this was that shoving those emotions down, which is what I feel like I had learned as a Mormon woman, it just made them bubble up in ways that I didn't expect. Often I found that my anger was expressed toward my children I, because it's a power dynamic. I was people above me were telling me to shove my anger down, and so my kids got the brunt of that. And I, I guess now I feel like you know, if you're angry with people, tell them that you're angry. Don't don't let the situation where you're shoving things down and the anger comes out at the wrong person. Um, I don't know. Just be more authentic. Thank you. Um. The other one is, has anyone else started their faith transition after the loss of a loved one? Um, I mean, I don't know every person, but I do know that there are several people that have uh, gone through a faith crisis directly after the loss of a loved one. I know Alan Mount is one of them. And um, yeah, I mean, his story is really interesting. His father died and was killed by a drunk driver. And you would imagine that that would make someone cling to the church's rules about not drinking alcohol more, but it, it, I think Alan's experience was similar to mine in this one way, and that neither of us felt 
any sense of a presence of the person who had died. And that was deeply disturbing to our Mormon worldview. I, I had many people in my extended family who came to me and told me that they'd had visions of mercy coming to them. And, and our bishop, um, he came to the hospital after Mercy was born, and he told us that he'd had a vision of, of Mercy that came to him when he was taking a shower to come over to the hospital. And he said he walked out and he said to his wife, uh, I hope they were having a girl. And she said, yeah, they were. He said, well, she just appeared to me. And she told this bishop that we were, that she was fine and that she was in heaven and we we're supposed to be happy. But I, I went to the temple over and over again in that year uh, the first couple of years after she died, and I just never had that sense of her. I, I never had that assurance. And then as I grew more, I don't know, as I sat more with my sense of my own guilt, I felt more and more like I didn't want to see her again. Like I would have to account for myself and all the failures in my life and explain to her somehow why she hadn't been with me. So I've come to a point where I don't really want to have that afterlife um, that other people so much feel sad about letting go of when uh, when they leave the church. I also think that um, for a lot of people, leaving the church can mean that you're grieving. You end up grieving a lot of things over again. I've heard that happen where, you know, you might lose a family member and then 10 years later you leave the church and then you grieve that person all over again because Mormonism often doesn't allow for grief. You are supposed to shove it that down and be the happy self and you're supposed to re think that that person isn't really dead they're just waiting for you and so you don't you're not sad about it i don't know if that's a good answer but it's the best i have all right the next one says my son-in-law died while we were on our mission and we didn't go home i can't forgive myself more just a comment but if you have anything to add i mean yeah we we this is this is the mess of being human i don't know i don't know if i have words for not for um forgiving yourself i i remember i talked was talking to a friend a few weeks ago and i was telling him about this talk i was planning to give and i was talking about how i had become suicidal after mercy's death because there were just so many things that I kept thinking, if I'd done this, then she would have been saved. If I'd done this, she would have been saved. And my friend said, oh, but you've forgiven yourself for that now. And I said, what? <laughs> I, I'm not sure that, that forgiveness even makes sense to me. I understand now that I can't go back in time and fix that. I understand that I wish I could. And I understand that like, I will carry the regret of that for the rest of my life forgiving myself again it i don't even know what that what what that means in my current framework you have to this is something you carry it is a human thing i can say to myself i am human i made mistakes i am still a worthwhile person to live even though sometimes i feel like i'm not a worthwhile person to live um I, we are all these humans that stumble around in the dark make a mess of stuff hurt the people that we love um I, I have no desire to pretend that somehow you can make up for that. I, I think if there's somebody to say sorry to, you can say I'm sorry and then um, keep on being human. You're, you're going to make more mistakes, I promise you. There may be even some that are worse than this. Is that terrible? That's a terrible answer. I haven't said anything nice or help you get over it or feel better about yourself. All I can say is from my perspective, none of those are the things that I'm interested in. I'm not interested in like patting myself on the back and saying, it's, you know, it's okay. Um, you can forgive yourself. I'm more interested in saying, yeah, you fucked up and you're going to keep fucking up. And this is what it means to be human. Everyone is all doing the same thing. All the people that hurt me and said stupid things to me, they're just all exactly like me. They're trying to do the best they can. They mess up and then they have to get up the next morning and do something. Okay, the next one. Your adult son has stage four cancer. You're completely blocked from his life with no reason being given. You have not been answered. If you can even be at the funeral, etc. How do you grieve positively from this? Wow, that's a hard situation to be in. Um, first of all, I'm I'm sorry. <sighs> I, 
but again, I, I keep feeling like people are asking me to frame things in terms of like grieving positively or moving on or whatever. And I feel like my talk has been all about like, that's not, I'm not interested in any of those things. You're going to be angry about that. And you're going to be feeling that loss forever for the rest of your life. I, I can't take that away from you. And I don't really have any desire to take it away from you. It is that's what it means to be human. I, I feel like so much of what I did when I was inside of Mormonism was trying to make myself be less human with this idea of like perfection and becoming more godlike. It cut off parts of me and I don't want to cut those parts off. Um, I mean, I don't know the situation you're in. I don't know what the grief is on the other side. I assume there must be some. Um, but you may not have time to find out what it is before the funeral. So I guess my best suggestion would be to have your own funeral of some kind um, at the same time the other one is going on where you can give yourself permission to process your grief. And I mean, I know that's a shitty answer, but I, I don't have perfect solutions for really, really difficult problems. Sorry. Okay, the next one. Quote, not being a good enough Mormon to pass the test, end quote. Do you believe it is harder for women to pass this test? Too much social pressure? Um, I think that men and women have really quite different experiences within Mormonism. And it's something that's frustrating to me because when I was a Mormon woman and would try to explain the Mormon men around me that there were different commandments for women. I mean, I really feel like the rules and, and people are like, oh, there's the same Ten Commandments. But really, the lived commandments of Mormonism for women are just so very different. The, the modesty talk and um, I actually have a list somewhere, which I ha will post in an essay called the, the Men's Commandments and the Women's Commandments. Um, but the weight that you carry of men's sins from looking at you, um, also women, uh, marriage is this and being a mother are these commandments in a way that I don't think they are for men. Um, losing your, losing yourself in your children and in your role as a, as a wife and mother are commandments within Mormonism. Um, I think that men leaving Mormonism lose more because women are, are so often marginalized with, within Mormonism. So I think in some ways it's easier for women to leave because the outside world offers you more. But on the other hand, it's also harder to leave because for those of us who are older, like I finished raising my kids and, and I love staying home with, with them, but I also have this mixed feelings of, I'm not sure that I made that choice with all of the information that maybe I should have had. And so I am left with, <sighs> a lot of mixed feelings about my decision not to pursue a career. I have a PhD and I'm a writer. There were other things I could have done. I could have done more part-time work. I could have tried to do full-time work. And now I'm left at age 50 with not knowing. It seems like my current PhD is worthless and I'd have to go back to school. And it's that part of being a, an ex-Mormon woman really sucks. And I'm not sure that ex-Mormon men or Mormon men can really understand what that means when you step out of a paradigm that you've accepted for a long time, so your whole life, and then you're left with how many years do I have left? So um, yes, it's harder in, in some ways. Yeah. Well, it looks like our time is just about up. There was one less, um, or one more, excuse me, comment on there that will be left and, and you can look at that later okay. on the app. I would like to um, thank everybody for attending and supporting Sunstone, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your Sunstone day. Thank you, Anne. You're welcome.